Hey guys, so a thing happened. Um, I drove out into the desert. I drove for like four hours. Whoops, uh, I think I'm south of Palm Springs. I don't know, I've never been to Palm Springs, but judging by all of the, uh, the old people in the hotel <laughs> that I just stayed at, um, yeah, I think I'm in Palm Springs. I'm going to Salvation Mountain today. Uh, yeah, last night, or it was like two nights ago, super late, and I was talking to Mark, and I was telling him about like how I've, like, everyone has that feeling like they want to just get out, you know, and like, I know Catherine does this thing where she'll drive to the beach at night, stuff like that. Uh, but I've been feeling that so much lately, like more and more every single night. I, I get real sad, and I get real wanting to get into my car and drive away. Uh, and Mark was like, well, maybe that's healthy. Like, maybe you should. And so the next night I did, I just left. Uh, yeah, it's weird because when I, like in school for a couple years there, I've always been the kind of person who wants to be alone most of the time. And I isolated myself for a while, like in college. And not in a bad way, I don't think. I think it was healthy. I'd like to think it was healthy, yeah. But I just love spending time with myself. And ever since I moved to LA, I've stopped. Like, I constantly, it's been a 180. I want to be around people all the time, at every moment. And like, being in, being alone in my apartment freaks me out. Like, it really scares me. Which is so bizarre to me, because it's not me. Uh, so, I think that's where my creative block has come from, I've realized. Been a bit of a breakthrough these last 24 hours. Yeah, I feel like I've been creatively stuck because I don't have a perspective anymore. I don't, I'm not familiar with myself. I don't know myself. So, I'm gonna try to know myself. I'm gonna drive out to the desert to see Salvation Mountain so I can get to know myself. Um, there was also kind of a personal tragic thing that happened yesterday, which I, I think is a another good reason for this trip coincidental but but it's good yeah i'm i'm feeling good i'm feeling really hyped about this uh yeah because it's like this isn't this isn't a call out post to my friends but uh I, i've gotten tired of like waiting for them uh to want to go on trips with me because like you know when you're working all the time when you have a free 10 hours you want to sleep or you want to like go to the movies by yourself uh not not do what I just did. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I have this kind of bucket list of places in California that I've been wanting to go, like Southern California, and I'm tired of waiting for my friends to, to want to go with me or to be free to go with me. Yeah. So I'm using this as a way to take care of myself. This is about self-care. Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna drive another hour south-ish and go and then drive like five hours back north. Be late for work. <laughs> it's okay. I. I got the approval. I got the that sweet boss approval from from Mark and the gang. But I wasn't throwing everyone under the bus for doing this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go now. Safety first. Put on your seatbelt, guys. The good shit. Okay, bye. And I dream of I found um, like five minutes from where I was before there was a uh, like a national not national park I don't think it was a national park but a I don't know a park service something something so now I'm pretending that I'm in RV and there's like this beautiful uh, what are they called stream it's like the silver RVs the stream stream something I completely forget um. But it looks so scenic and I want to take a picture, but I'm scared they're like awake and you're gonna see me taking a picture of their their RV. So I'm just gonna admire it from afar. And if you can take a mental picture, the Silver Stream Stream Air RV. Okay, I'm so glad. Hold on, side note, I'm so glad I didn't drive over there because an old man just got out of that RV like just now. I would have felt so bad. I would have felt so creepy. Okay, okay, okay. I'm here. There's like no one around besides the people who I assume kind of manage the place. So it's a little weird that I'm just here. 
existing, but I'm gonna go walk around. I'm gonna check it out. I spent probably about an hour just wandering around and it was funny uh, when I got there, I got there early because later on, it was like when I was leaving there were just a group of It was dead when I got there in the morning. It was just the caretakers uh, who stay there. I don't know if they live there, if they're, they're on and off, like East Jesus, which is the other place I went to. So I wandered around uh, when I first got there because I was just there by myself. And actually there was a guy who was also wandering around. His name, okay, I met multiple people today and I don't remember a single one of their names. Like I actively tried to remember and I still forgot. Everyone should wear name tags all the time I just can't do it. I can't remember. It was either John or James, this guy with the black beanie. Uh, but he was there for the same reason I was. Like, he had driven out by himself just to go. Although he was staying around Slab City for like a week or two, he said. Um, not just popping in for a day like I was. And so we talked, we bonded for a while over that, which is really cool. Just like had the same, same emotional response to it. And he's great because he reminded me I don't know if you've heard of East Jesus. It's not as well known as like Salvation Mountain is, but it's right up the street. It's actually inside of Slab City, kind of in the back. And it's this community of folk artists who come and go. I, community is the only word I can think to describe it. I know there's an actual word for it, but I can't think of it at the moment. So the guy I talked to, whose name I don't remember, uh, was super chill. He said that like in the summer, usually there's only maybe two people around just cause it's so unbelievably hot. Um, but like in the, the winter, they'll have, you know, there's parties or bands will go out there and hang and perform. So there'll be like big groups of people there sometimes. It's just kind of whoever shows up. And if you go and there's someone around who's free, they'll kind of walk you around and give you a tour. And I wish I remembered the guy's name because I'll show you his art. And he builds these robots out of just, you know, found parts. And he also had this thing called the, the time machine. And I wish I had it on film, but I didn't want to be that guy. I'd be like, oh, can you film this, you know? I didn't want to do that. But he built the time machine and it's this big metal time machine made of keyboards and, I mean, keyboards and keyboards, like piano keyboard computer keyboard and you sit on it and it, you can spin around in circles and it's just kind of will spin forever unless you stop it it was funny because he was like oh yeah be careful there's there's just sharp metal because it's just like whatever people have welded together it's really cool some of the the work is more political but some of it is just 
Like someone built a bowling lane. You can bowl. It was just really refreshing the entire trip. To spend time with myself and to admire folk art just for what it is and for existing. And the fact that you can drive out into the desert and look at art for free. And if you go, they take donations, so you should help them out so they can keep spreading joy and so they can be maintained. That was the issue with the first video I had recorded and edited that didn't post because all the parts were great and it followed a similar theme where I wanted to talk about the illustration scene in LA and I wanted to go to places that featured the illustration scene and talk about what I loved about it. And all the, yeah, all the components were really nice, but it had no heart. I kept saying I wanted to talk about art and didn't talk about art. It didn't really have a point besides like, I went to this place and I saw this thing. And I guess that's what this video is, but I feel a little bit more impromptu about it. Like I, I didn't, I brought my nice camera, but I didn't go out with the express purpose of being like, let's shoot a thing, this is my end goal. It's like, let's just go and look at art. And then if I can film some nice stuff about it, then I'll piece it together. And I think that's what I need to do because I'm not at the point where I can script something out, talk about it and have it not sound rehearsed. It sounds like I was doing a school presentation or something. So for now at least, it's just gonna be this quality, quality content. <laughs> because it's, it's what I wanna make and it's what I'm comfortable making right now. There's not really an end to this video. I'm just gonna drive home now, finish driving home. But hopefully you enjoyed it if you made it this far. If you have any thoughts about uh, literally anything, if you just have a thought, if you just have a goddamn opinion, let me know. Uh, and I will talk to you guys soon. Okay, bye!
So last weekend I drove back down to the desert, which is where I've discovered I feel the most motivated creatively. Uh, for my birthday I wanted to take a couple days off because I rarely, if ever, have just a full day to relax to myself. And that's kind of what happens when you're surrounded by people whose life is their work. Like vacations or days off just aren't really a concept when you're always like looking for the next big project to tackle. And it's even harder to find a time where a friend can make time with you. So I end up doing a lot of things by myself that I want to do because it's hard. It really is difficult to find time with multiple people to make plans. So I made a decision after my last trip that I wanted to visit in the Integratron, which I'll talk more about in a second. So I booked a reservation back like in early March and found a place to stay. And I told Mark that I was giving him a few months long warning, uh, but that all I wanted for my birthday was for him to get a couple days ahead of work so he could go for the drive with me. Especially after my trip to Slab City, I'd been itching to show someone else around and explore more, so that's pretty much exactly what we did. What are you uh, making? I'm making scrambled eggs for you for your birthday. Oh. So there's no one around really as far as neighbors go. So I thought it'd be a good idea to put windows in the showers. Can you see him? That's nice. How's it hanging? Good. You good? He I could. love the chicken. The trip itself was really creatively compelling because when we talked about work, it wasn't about schedules or workflow or time management, which it often ends up being. It was purely about ideas and concepts that we wanted to explore and what we wanted to learn and where we wanted it to go. And it was nice to be able to focus for once just on the why and not the how. So the place we stayed at was this house down a super bumpy road with a road not maintained sign at the front. And I drive a Prius, so it was a bit of an adventure every time we went anywhere. But most of the trip we were just relaxing and coming up with new ideas. All right, so the dealio is, it's like double gated. So we're when so we get safe. in here. How do I open it? Okay, hold on. How do you lock that after you're inside? There's one on the other side. You can hop the fence, you're spry. I could. Ew. What's that gonna stop anyone else from hopping the fence? We're gonna get murdered. Well, I think we're pretty safe here. There's no one around to murder us. We drove around Pioneer Town, where a lot of westerns were filmed back in the 40s. It was built by a bunch of filmmakers like Roy Rogers, and a lot of the town burnt down about 10 years back. I think in 07, I'm not sure. Um, burnt down in a fire, but there's still some bits of it standing in a restaurant that we stopped at. And that's kind of an obscure fact about me, which is that I'm really passionate about Westerns. Uh, they're fascinating to me in the same way I guess that reality TV and junk media interest me, in that they're, they were produced for like the common folk or whatever, um, but there's a lot of nuance to the genre itself. And I took a class actually on it in college, and I think that's what really got me into it like I am today. We also went to Joshua Tree, where neither of us had ever been before. Growing up, my parents took me on a road trip through a bunch of the national parks out west, uh, which gave me a massive appreciation for the park system, but I'd never seen Joshua Tree before. And we missed the the bloom, the big bloom in the spring, but that meant the park itself was pretty empty. And we drove to the center of the park to Keith Point, which is about seven-ish miles up and into the park, where you can see all the way to Salton Sea, which I uh, visited in my first video. And sometimes you can see Mexico, but there's all the smog now, so it's really Ooh, not possible. Off of your strength. Maybe if you just cut some into pieces and then you can get it. The mother load. Gross. Gross. The main reason I wanted to go out there was to visit the Integratron. And I'm about to nerd out about the history really quick, which might be super boring to you, but I think it's super awesome. So the structure was built by George Van Tassel over about the course of 20 years in the 50s and 60s. He was an aircraft mechanic who held these meditation groups in this room that an excavator built under giant rock. In the, the spot, the room under giant rock, became a big hotspot for UFO enthusiasts and George claimed 
that he was woken up there one night by a UFO filled with aliens from Venus who gave him plans to build the Integratron. It supposedly would rejuvenate you and extend your life, and he also talked about its anti-gravitational abilities and potentially time travel, and the, the science quote-unquote is founded on the Tesla coil and the multiple wave oscillator, but George claimed that electromagnetism affected your biological cells, and that each of your own cells have its own electromagnetic frequency, so basically he was saying that the Integratron would recharge your cells like a battery. And the building itself was funded by mainly the group of the UFO enthusiasts who gathered at a uh, an annual giant rock spacecraft convention that he held, which is super cool. And Howard Hughes actually funded a large portion of the Integratron, which honestly doesn't come as a surprise to me. And George died before the Integratron was fully finished, and the complete plans for it were lost along with him, so it sort of fell into disrepair for a while. And at one point there were plans to turn it into a disco, uh, but recently three sisters bought it, and now they hold these sound baths there, which is what I went to. You ready? So there's, there's a few okay. alternatives. What? Well, either we get disintegrated and sacrificed to the Integratron, or, yeah, that's what or we uh, will survive and be re-energized from the other people that will be sacrificed. Either way, there's sacrifice there's happening. There's only one person comes, <laughs> 20 go and one comes out. <laughs> but that one person is so powerful. It's your birthday, so I'd sacrifice myself for you, so you could have that power. <laughs> so if you have an appointment, they'll bring you inside and they talk you through some of the history of the building. And then you and about, I think there are like 20 people or so, they bring you upstairs up this ladder into the dome itself and you lay on these mats in a big circle with blankets and stuff. And they have someone play melted down quartz bowls. Uh, when I went, it was one of the daughters of the owners, which was cool. And the entire building, including the nails and stuff, are all made out of wood, so none of the metal would disrupt like the frequencies. Although there was an air conditioner in it, which I'm wondering if that would affect it in the same way. Honestly, the sound was something I'd never experienced before. Like it bounced between my left and right ears around the room. And if someone was directly across the room from you, if they like sniffed or made any sort of noise, like my stomach growled once and I felt so bad for the person across from me because it sounded like they were whispering in your ear no matter like how quiet it was. So the whole experience is sort of like a meditation. So they play the bowls for about a half hour and then afterwards they'll play some like ambient quartz bowl music, I guess. I know a lot of people are going to dismiss this sort of thing as like hippy dippy bullshit, which is totally fair on multiple levels. One, because the original science behind the Integratron is total bunk, and sure, maybe listening to someone play quartz while you lay on the floor isn't going to be life changing or reverse your negative ions, but I did feel reset. There is something comforting about wellness and new agey psychosomatic beliefs. It's like you do a juice cleanse or whatever spiritual placebo and you feel better because you tell yourself it makes you feel better. And I really don't believe that there's any harm in that. Plus, my experience at the Integratron was genuinely fun and totally a new sensory experience. I think West Coast health culture takes itself way too seriously nowadays, but the Integratron was an idea from decades ago. It goes to show that new age ideas really aren't all that new. And while it's kind of another example of a counterculture being like co-opted by folksy types or people like me, there's a comfort in knowing that there's still an appreciation for these kind of places and to keep them alive and running. And it was a reminder for me not to take anything I do too seriously and to just enjoy the things that I love purely because it brings me joy, whether or not people are going to judge it for being too trendy or even too alien. So for a little post content update for those of you who care about me making videos and such, um, I've learned I love filming location based videos. I hate that whole holding the camera in front of me walking vlog because I'm really self conscious and I'm just not good at it. But I do love documenting new places that I go and making more visually appealing videos first and foremost, which is why I haven't posted anything lately. I've been focused on my day to day work for Mark's channel alongside I just well, I guess a month ago, moved into a new place with Catherine. So sometimes it's good for me to just let myself drift a little. Like I'm just doing my everyday work and focusing on personal relationships and making my new place feel really homey. But I spent this last weekend enjoying some passive experiences. 
like just looking at the stars at night or looking at the desert during the day or just generally looking at things and not doing much else and it was refreshing to absorb so much and now I really feel like I want to put that I don't know I guess energy if you will back into the world and the work that I'm doing and if there's one rule that I'm holding myself to, it's to not let myself feel pressure of needing to upload a video or post anything publicly. I don't really feel a need to upload all the time, and I don't really want to. I'm completely surrounded by my friends whose lives are dedicated to YouTube, and I work with them every day on their channels. And the majority of the time, I'm completely happy just helping other people and bringing their visions to life. Like, I love that technical side of someone having an idea and figuring out how the hell we're going to make it real. That's what I really enjoy. But living in that passionate and driven of an environment really does inspire me. So like, inevitably over time, I sometimes reach a point where I want to work on a project that's entirely self-serving. Like it's just a little thing for me to chip away at. So I suppose that's kind of my reasoning for people who are wondering like, why I bother uploading at all if I'm not keeping a schedule. Because for me, it's just sort of a creative outlet, but it's not a driving passion like it is for my friends. Uh, I just kind of want to make cool things with cool people and I don't know where that's gonna lead me. But I guess we'll have to find out, so thanks for sticking around and I will talk to you guys again soon. Bye! What are we listening to? ABBA! Again! Forever! On loop. This is the song that plays when I go on a killing rampage. Thank you. Like when I lose my mind, it's just oh, Abba. Shit. Well, here comes the killing rampage. Oh! Hey guys. So, since it's getting really warm out, I wanted to share with you how I make my favorite cold brew. And I'm also gonna make a few different homemade flavor syrups that I think are super fun to play around with. So cold brew is one of the easiest ways to brew coffee, but it's an overnight process, which is why I'm starting in the evening. And as far as ingredients go, all you're gonna need is a bag of your favorite coffee beans and some water. As far as beans go, this is my absolute favorite. There are whole beans from this local shop called Phil's that I'm obsessed with. They don't do any espresso drinks, so they only focus on like a bunch of different blends of drip coffee. So my favorite is called Ether, which is their absolute darkest blend, which they say is like toffee, cherry, and cinnamon. Although I'm pretty sure they used to describe it as tobacco, but I guess that wasn't really a good selling point. Um, I also have Ambrosia Coffee of God, which is a lighter blend, and they say it's like blackberry, grape, and toast. And these are all whole beans, but you can use pre-ground beans and skip this step, but you'll want to make sure that they're coarsely ground first. So when you're brewing coffee, generally you want to use filtered water because that'll give it a slightly cleaner and sweeter taste. But cold brew is one of like the most relaxed ways of making coffee, so really tap water works fine. So I'm going about this in like a bit of a try-hard kind of way. So I have a bunch of gadgets, but they're totally optional and most of this is just kind of trial and error and figuring out what you like. This is my new French press that I got for my birthday that I'm totally in love with. It's stoneware, um, but most cheaper French presses are just made of glass or honestly, you can just chuck beans and water in any kind of jar or container and use that. Uh, but using a French press for cold brew makes straining it a lot easier. I'm using my own grinder since I like to buy whole bean and then grind them myself based on how I'm making my coffee. And this is just a super duper cheap Krups grinder. Um, there are nicer ones that have individual settings for all the grinds, like you get in an espresso machine where you just adjust the pressure on your own. And those will give you a way more even particle size, but this little guy works totally fine for me. And if I'm getting really picky about my grind, I'll just have the person at the shop do it. I also have a little ceramic coffee dripper. Mine is by Hario, which I think is the one that pretty much everyone has. And honestly, if you're only gonna buy one coffee gadget, I'd recommend getting a dripper because they're super versatile. They basically do the same job as a French press, but they're way less of a fuss to clean. So I'm using a scale to measure out my beans, which is also totally optional. I'm doing a seven to one water to coffee ratio. So the recipe I'm using has 70 grams of coffee to 500 milliliters of water, or like 140 grams for a liter. And that's basically enough for a big mug or two if you dilute it down, which you probably will. And if you wanna make a bigger batch, I've also done a quarter of a pound of beans to uh, four cups of water. This is all just a bit of a guessing game, um, but since we're making a pretty strong concentrate, you always dilute it down a bunch when you pour yourself a glass. 
And one of the great things about cold brew is that you can use older or more worse off beans because you don't get that same bitterness that you normally get if you try to make hot drip coffee with them. So I want them coarse rather than finely ground because cold brew is a slower process and if the beans are too finely ground, you'll end up with an over extracted and bitter coffee. Uh, but with my cheapo grinder, I just kind of pulse it for a few seconds and I probably ground this one way too fine, but I'm just gonna roll with it. And I'll dump that directly into my French press or whatever container you're using. Then I pour the water in and I make sure that I spill it everywhere. So typically you'll want to use room temperature water, although if you're in a bit more of a rush and you want it done in under 12 hours, you could start with hot water. That'll change the flavor of your coffee slightly for better or for worse since it's more of like a, a normal drip coffee you'd get. So give everything a stir and just a little piece of advice, if you're using a glass French press, always use a wooden spoon to stir, otherwise you'll crack the glass, which I've done multiple times. Then pop the lid on with the plunger all the way up and then you stick that whole thing in the fridge overnight. So I've time traveled into the future and it's tomorrow morning. This is one of my favorite mugs. Uh, I got it in Brighton, it's a little bird. And I'm also using a mason jar because I just know what kind of person I am and they're really practical, so whatever, it's fine. I have this jumbo ice cube tray and like normally you'd use it if you're drinking scotch, but I like using them for coffee because it keeps the melting ice from diluting so quickly. Or if you're feeling kind of extra ambitious, you can make coffee ice cubes so you don't have to worry about it at all. You just freeze some of your leftover cold brew from this batch for the next round that you make. So take your cold brew out of the fridge and you have to be careful through these next steps because you don't want to agitate the grounds too much since they're really volatile now. Uh, you pop the dripper and the paper filter on top of your cup and then you gently pour that mixture in and it should pass through in a couple of minutes. Also just a warning, cold brewing coffee, you usually get about double the caffeine content as you would in like a hot drip coffee and the flavor is way stronger. So you can dilute it down with like water or milk or whatever you like. I usually do about two thirds cold brew and the last third milk or water. And that is it. It probably felt like a ton of steps, but when you boil it down, it's all super simple. And the cold brew should keep pretty well in your fridge for about a week or two, but it'll kind of break down over time. I went to the farmer's market this morning where I got these super lovely flowers, uh, but I also picked up a big pack of blackberries because I wanted to make a few jars of syrup to mix in with my coffee. And there's really nothing to making syrup. I mean, you're just melting down sugar into water for a few minutes. So I'm doing three different variations. I'm doing a brown sugar cinnamon, a lavender, and a blackberry. Um, but sometimes I'll just kind of take whatever I have lying around and mix those together. So like you could do a, a peach and thyme flavored one or a strawberry and rose. But they're super simple. All you do is you melt down your sugar and your water and then you add whatever you want and you just let it come together. That's really it. I'll put some of the specifics um, on the video here so you can see what I'm doing if you want real measurements, but I just always wing it. And that is it. And these will store in your fridge for a couple weeks and I use them on basically everything. Like I'll stick them on ice cream sometimes, that sort of thing. They're fun and they're fun to play around with. So I hope you enjoyed this um, random little coffee video. If you did, let me know and I will talk to you later. All right, bye. Dun 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 YouTube wants to copyright me So to avoid that please pretend this is a cover of Rasputin 
I'm sorry for this, copyright really sucks, and I didn't want to mute out this part. Dun 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 Hello friends! Welcome to my new recording setup. Um, I wanted to do a video today where I talk about what's on my bookshelf behind me because I haven't had shelves like in my apartment at all until now so I've had all these boxes of like my knickknacks and non-essentials that I haven't unpacked until recently um, and I was going through all the boxes and I'm like oh, I love this thing and I love this thing so now I just want to talk about all the things that I have so that's what we are going to do. Sound good? Cool beans, let's do it. Also, do you guys like my pillow, my jazz horse pillow? You guys know jazz horse? You guys know jazz horse, you guys are hip. Hip end up on the old memes, am I right? Ugh. 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 Okay, let's look at some stuff. So the first couple shelves at the bottom are my shoes because the apartment that me and Catherine live in is like an open floor concept studio thing. So like there's no walls, which is why this exists behind me uh, to be a wall. There's not really any doors on anything and there's no storage space at all. It's horrible. So I have to keep all of my stuff shoved into my closet. So moving the shoes out here, I figure is kind of cute and like useful, like a little shoe rack and also clears up tons of space in my little closet. Some notable shoes may include these little bird vans that Catherine got me for my birthday. They're covered in little embroidered primary color birds. I love them very much, but they're white, so I'm afraid of wearing them out too much and getting them dirty. I need to get one of those protectant spray things. These are my Rihanna Puma Creepers. Um, I'm not normally like a waiting for a new line to drop or whatever, like line up outside the Supreme hours before they open or anything. But these I did get up super early for because they were the first time that she released these. I love them very much. They're very comfy. And I love being taller than everyone. So they got a little bit of a lift on them. Speaking of lift, these are even taller. These were like my first big girl nice purchase that I made after I got my first real job out here. Uh, and the lace is all chewed up on one of these because I got these like right after I moved here and it was right when Mark got Chica. So I wore these over the first day I got them to his place and she first thing chewed up the lace on here, which was my fault for leaving them on the floor. But now it's kind of sentimental because I never replaced the lace. I've also got these rainbow crush slides. They're from Unif and they're super, I don't know, they're loud. I love it when it's loud. And also they have a lift, which is good. I love these guys, they're real goofy and they're cute, and they're rainbow, which is ideal. Ideally, everything is rainbow, except not, because I prefer everything to be in black and white, except for these shoes. So moving up the wall, we have Marzipan's nook that I made for her, because Catherine told me when I got my bookshelf that she loves to hide in little nooks, which she does, and so she loved the bookshelf, but I don't think she does because she's old, so she's not very good at jumping, and it's pretty shallow, it's like 10 inches deep, so I don't think, I think she's afraid of the jump. I'm telling myself that but we'll see if she gets used to it. Uh, I also have a birch wood little lanyard up there. I'm hoping she would chew on it maybe. I hope she doesn't chew on it, but I hope it motivate her to jump. It has not. Um, and then I have a little beefalo, which Chica was over here this morning and she hadn't seen the bookshelf before and she walked in and just sniped it right off the bookshelf first thing. She's like, all right, that's mine. It's not hers, it's mine for the record. Then behind me, I have a little this one doesn't have a theme. I realized when I was putting stuff on this bookshelf that it's kind of like a dollhouse. I was separating it into like, trying to separate it into categories, kind of. I don't know, it's gonna need some more work, some more sorting. Cause every time I, I lay in bed and look at it, I'm like, well, that could go there or that could go here. So right now this is kind of a random one, but I have my little D&D &D dice, which are a primary color. I guess you could say the theme is yellow, except not everything in it is yellow and there's yellow on other shelves. I have my little baby Gudetama which normally I don't like pop figures, but this one I had to get because it's Gutama. 
I'm not a collectible person either, but like if Sanrio is gonna make a lazy egg, I'm gonna get everything that they make that's a lazy egg. And this was a Hot Topic exclusive when it came out, so I had to order it from Hot Topic, which is only a motivator, let's be honest. He's using bacon, like it's a little scarf, a little bacon scarf. This is my little Isabel plushie. I think Mark won this for me in one of those like Japanese crane game machines where you have to push stuff. Um, Animal Crossing is my favorite game series, I think. At least it's like the one I play the most. Waiting for it to come out on the Switch. Make me a new one, please. I don't like playing on a DS. City Folk was the best one because it was on a big screen. I'm just saying, Nintendo. Wink. I've also got my Oswald hat, which is covered in cat hair, I've just realized. That's disgusting. Let's put that on the ground. Mm. I'm not like a Disney fangirl or anything, but I love Oswald and um, I took some Disney animation courses in college, so I, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm not like a movie person, nor am I a Disney person, but I am a Disney film person from like more of an academic standpoint, I guess, which sounds stupid, um, but when they put the Oswald little gas station at the entrance to California Adventure. Became obsessed with getting all the Oswald merch. So I got this guy, very cute. I don't like that I'm the kind of person who has to get mouse ears when they go to Disney. I don't know why I feel so compelled to get them every time. I don't want to be that person. I know I'm never going to wear them after like the five hours that I'm there, but I always get them. They get me every time. So the next shelf over is my alien themed shelf. It might be my favorite, but it's definitely the most cohesive one that I have. So the first thing is this print that I got. It's by the artist from Apollina with Love. They're on Society6, but don't look them up if you're like underage or something because most of their stuff is super explicit, um, as is this one, hence the censors. But it's real cute. It's like an alien girl and a little astronaut. It's got that uh, siren kind of thing going, but in space, which is really cool. Then I have my little Joshua tree. Uh, what do you call that? Like a ward thing. Uh, I figured it was slightly relevant because the stargazing in Joshua tree is so good. Space aliens, close enough. Then I stretch the theme even further with my Zolo set. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys had these as kids. They're like, let me grab it. They are these little pieces, building blocks, and you can make little creatures out of them. They got eyes. This one is Chance. I think they have like five or six different sets, so I need to get more, because they're so fun. I love kids building toys that basically can double as like a little piece of shelf art. Um, I was looking at marble runs the other day, because I want to just get like, five or six boxes of them and build like a mega marble run against my wall. I love that stuff. Then there's the alien license plate, which Catherine got me from Baker, which is the little drive through town between like LA and Las Vegas, which is a drive that Catherine and I make all the time. So whenever we go, we stop and get like alien merch. So she got that for me. Yeah, I'm covered in your fur. Then I have a couple gifts that people have given me at conventions and things. This is from Riley. I'm not sure if she has a Twitter. And this one is from J-O-M-L-J, I think. Yeah, uh, it's a little alien drinking Duncan. And I love this guy, it's so cool. It's so pretty. So thanks for these. They're on my little art shelf. Then I have a little sticker. I'm not 100%, I know I got it from Big Bud Press who made like my gross shirt uh, and those ones. And I think that this is their design, but I know I got it when I bought stuff from them because they put little goodies in it. It's a little rainbow UFO. Then, okay, so one of my best friends, Maria, made this for me because we do a big secret Santa every year. It's like me and my old hometown friends. It's a tradition that we have. And she loves thrift shopping, so she always like gets weird thrift store stuff for me. And so she bought a nativity scene and then painted an alien onto baby Jesus. I hope. Well, I'm sure some people will be upset about this, but I love it, I'm gonna be honest. Um, it cracks me up and it reminds me of her. It's great, it's very thoughtful, love a good craft. So then just moving up the shelf further, we have my music shelves. So my first one has my gorilla stuff and my accordion. I love this accordion to death. I have two accordions actually. My first accordion was a little red accordion and it was only an octave and a half on the keyboard and it had less chords on the one side. 
so after about a year of playing, I had done formal, like very formal piano lessons for about eight years beforehand. And then I switched over to accordion in high school. Um, and I outgrew that one really quick. So I got this universal guy. I love him because it's like got glittery yellow keys, which I think is super cool. I will play you a ditty, but it's been, it's been years since I've played. So it's not gonna be very good. So then I have my Gorillaz DVDs. I have phase one and phase two, which are the two DVD releases that they did. These are cool. I love these guys. And then my most prized possession is my Rise of the Ogre copy. So no one is going to believe me um, that I didn't take this from the Boston Public Library. That is in fact what happened. I owe the BPL a lot of money. So far they haven't come after me, but if there was a way to just send them cash for this, I would. It was basically when I, I moved uh, and I had finals and I didn't return it and then I realized that I was never going to be in Boston again. So maybe for PAX I'll like drop a hundred in the slot or something for it because I feel awful about it. There's another thing too, I think this book is magical because I swear to you when I first got it there was a page that had been cut out of it, like someone had cut out a picture of Murdoch or something. Um, but now I've just been flipping through it and I can't find where the cutout was but I swear it was there. So I think it repaired itself. I also, I need to find my Monkey Journey to the West playbill because I saw that when it happened. I love Gorillaz fans. I'm sure you guys probably know Monkey Journey to the West was like Jamie's opera that he did. Um, and like they randomly did a show in Charleston, which is where I grew up for Spoleto. So I got to see it as a kid and I have proof that I saw it, but I think that's at my parents' place. I don't think I have it here. But that's a cool thing that I did and I think that's probably where my love of gorillas stemmed from. So moving up again to the top of that side of the wall, I have my Radiohead little vinyl collection. So ever since In Rainbows, my brother has always gotten me their like deluxe vinyl edition that they put out with their albums because they always have some weird thing where you get like these tiny works of art or they always do funky stuff for their deluxe editions. If you listen to them, you know that. Um, this one doesn't have In Rainbows currently because I think that's back home in Ohio but these are uh, for King of Limbs and a Moonshake Pool I have. And I also have a little glass head because it's a cool glass head and I felt like get a radio head, Ugh, it's a pun. It's uh, kind of. So directly behind me, there are three more little shelves. The first one at the bottom has all of my cameras. Right now it just has my analog ones and I'm using my digital one. So I have my refurbished Polaroid and my yellow Fuji film. And then I also have a little photography book that I really like. So above that, I have these cute little napkins and it's those napkins that I love them so much I'm afraid to use them because I don't want to like waste them. So one day I will have an event that's important enough to use my cute napkins. They remind me of a circus. And then I have my wishbone bottle opener. I used to have a wishbone, like a gold wishbone necklace that I really loved that I lost. Like I lose all of my jewelry. That's why I only wear super cheap jewelry because I will inevitably lose it. Same with sunglasses. I smash them in my bag. So I replaced it with a little gold bottle opener. I like drinking beer. I'm really into craft beer because I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Cincinnati, so craft beer is a big thing. And this bottle opener is kind of special. We also have one that Catherine's mom gave us that's shaped like a man. So he's just the man. So it depends on what kind of mood we're in if we're drinking with the like wishbone bottle opener or the man. So then I have my little succulent behind that. And then I have, I love this thing. It's a little weird. It's a match strike. It's a Maison Dupree reproduction, which they were popular kind of like the 19th century, early 20th century. And it's a way that you light matches and you just strike it on the thing. The thing about this is that it takes strike anywhere matches. So the matches you get today are like safety matches where you have to strike it on the box, but these you can just kind of light like up against the wall or something or on this guy. Um, but obviously they're not as safe. So there's only one company I think who still actively makes them and they were hard to hunt down. So I had to bulk buy them on eBay. So I have a huge box of matches now that I'm never gonna use. 
but they're fun for lighting candles. They're very fancy. I feel fancy when I use it. Then at the tip top, I have this teapot, which is also one of my most prized possessions. I got this teapot in Boston when I was thrift shopping with one of my old roommates, Tori. We, in the winter, would go into Cambridge, which is close to where we lived, and we go to, if you know Cambridge, you know the name of this place. It's like a vegan breakfast place. It's a diner, really cool. And then we go thrift shopping and I found this primary color teapot color covered, it's a primary cover, primary color teapot covered in teapots, which I'm convinced was made for me. And I remember on that same trip, Tori found it was a deviled egg holder that was covered in like the Zodiac signs. Incredible, who knew that that existed? So that was a good day and it reminds me of Boston and college and you know, all the Boston stuff. Boston tea party, maybe? It's a stretch. Then on the other side, I have my bookshelf. My one shelf that has books on the bookshelf. The actual bookshelf, the bookshelf TM. Obviously, this is not all of the books that I own, but books are so heavy that I haven't moved them all from like old places that I've lived in stuff. So this is kind of like the pared down so far what I've managed to get out to LA. Some of the notable ones include the first edition of Saga, the big like collective that they did. Um, I also have the Twin Peaks book that they put out with recently. Don't spoil the new season of Twin Peaks, please. I haven't watched it. Please don't spoil it. Then I have a biography about the Donner Party because I love the Oregon Trail and cannibalism is fascinating. This is actually a really good read. I have some Kurt Vonnegut. This is actually my favorite book that I've read recently. If like you're into typography or graphic design, this is my favorite like thing I've ever read in that genre. It's by Simon Garfield. It's called Just My Type. And it's hilarious. That's the thing. It's like about text, but it's so funny. I definitely would recommend this. Then I've got my favorite graphic novel of all time. I haven't read a lot, but this is my favorite. It's called We Three. It's about a little robot dog and cat and bunny, and it's real sad, and it takes like a half hour to read. It's a great one, I'd recommend it. And the back has like behind the scenes sketches and things um, and iterations and how they like came up with some of the weird panels that they do. And then most importantly, I have everything you need to know about the goth scene, because none of us know enough about the goth scene and we need a book to tell us everything that we need to know, including chapter one, the origins of goth, we have gothic lifestyle, gothic fashion, there's a glossary. I've got my little cactus that I got at this tiny little cactus shop in Echo Park. Most of my plants are just like from Home Depot or somewhere, but that one I got at a real bona fide cactus shop and the people who sold it to me knew their shit about cactuses, so somehow it's more special than the other ones. At least I'd be more upset if I managed to kill it. Because I've killed cactuses before, it's very easy. Then I have, because it doesn't fit, like vertically into the shelf. I have my VHS cover art book. It mostly covers um, films that came out like in the 80s in England. So I don't know a lot of them, but it's a really cool book for inspiration. Cause I love doing like 80s, 90s, retro, whatever. Cause that's, that's what's trendy right now. So the last and top shelf is probably the coolest one. It's got the cool stuff on it. It's all kind of circusy themed somehow. Not really, but it feels like it. First, I have this uh, animal cracker tin, good for storing the not cute stuff that doesn't look as cool on the shelf, just storing the junk. I've got this ceramic balloon animal dog that has no purpose, but it's cool. Got a little clock that lights up and the tick is not very loud, so I actually like it. And analog clocks are way better than digital, so it's a good one. There's the Cool Cat Kids Club tin Garfield sign that I've got. Um, it came from this thrift shop in Cincinnati that like doubles, not as an animal shelter, but they raise money for animal shelters and like they always have dogs fenced in that are up for adoption. It's really cool. Then there's my favorite, favorite, favorite thing, which is this bear, right? This bear is a shaved ice maker. So you put it in his head and then as you turn it, nope, wrong way, his eyes move. Nope, there they go. His eyes move. He looks back and forth as you make shaved ice. And that is it. That is the entirety of my bookshelves in their current state, although that will probably change. Um, let me know if any of this stuff is interesting to you or, you know, is relevant to your life. And I'll talk to you in the comments below and I will talk to you all again very soon. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.